In the UK, the problem of nightmare neighbours has never been worse. Oi, you were assaulting me. I was shaking. I was absolutely terrified. One in five of us has been at war with next door. Never forget that, scumbag. <laughs> Where flaring tempers can turn home life into a living hell. We dread coming home. Coming up, a neighbourhood boundary dispute ends in a violent battle. My husband had blood all over his face and I thought he was dead. There was blood everywhere. Blood was all over the place. As the cyclist said, I look like something out of a horror picture. A couple are terrified for their safety as life at home becomes a nightmare. He just shouted at me, just tell me where he is. And a small dog causes tempers to flare. Oi! Academic James Killian, his wife Angela and their two boys thought they would be living the dream when they moved to rural Wales. In 2006, they'd moved to their perfect home right on the edge of the Gower Peninsula. Everything was ideal. Um, the kids could do what they wanted, and Gower offered all the things that uh, we had expected that it would offer. We were out in the countryside, basically, and it was just ideal. Their first encounters with neighbours were anything but. Behind our property, uh, we have a property called Cannesland Park, which is a mobile home site, mainly for retirement people. In fact, I think they have a rule which says that children are not allowed there. We thought, well, uh, you know, that's going to be quiet. Elderly people, it's not going to be any hassle. It's been just a nightmare. After a few months of living here, I came to the gate and I could see that there was a man with his dump truck and he was tipping out a load of rubble and sticks or whatever and I shouted to him, I said, you can't leave that rubbish there. And he shouted back and said, it's my land. He said, I can do what I like. Angela pointed out they in fact had a right of way through the gate. And an hour later, the debris disappeared. That was my first encounter with Mr Cunningham. Mr Cunningham is the owner of the caravan park and landlord to the residents of the park. It's a funny place. It was originally, I think, um, mobile homes. But since then, they've become semi-mobile homes. But they are essentially like a Winnebago on stilts. Although the family heard nothing more from Mr Cunningham and the residents of the park, this was to be the start of a very nasty relationship. The family continued to enjoy their dream life, but kept an ever watchful eye on the caravan park that lay behind the trees at the end of their garden. We'd been here about five years then, and everything had been lovely. We were just minding our own business. Every weekend there would be a house full of children. But their next encounter with their neighbours put an end to their domestic bliss. Our son went down there once, and uh, we had all kinds of aggravation from them in relation to children aren't allowed down here and this kind of thing, but um, uh, that was the only contact we had. However, what happened in May 2012 would change their lives forever. It was a cracking hot day. Uh, we hadn't had a day like that for a long time. We were out in the garden trying to tidy it up, and I was cutting this hedge we had some twigs that had not naturally fallen off the tree here, and uh, we decided to burn them and get rid of them. So I had made the fire, something similar, maybe about twice the size of that, nothing bigger than that, and uh, I let, set light to it. And uh, obviously there was a little bit of smoke when it started off, but it was a dead calm day. There was nothing happening at all, and the smoke just went up and more or less disappeared. And then I heard a lady shouting over the fence, so that's when I walked, started to walk over. A head popped over the fence, but I didn't speak to them. My wife spoke to them, whoever they were. And she said to put the fire out. And they were complaining about a small amount of smoke that really wasn't going in their direction anyway. She was quite nasty. She was quite abrupt. I said, OK, so we'll put it out. And with that, I turned to my husband and I said, put the fire out, will you? And I said, we've got to keep the peace. Famous last words. So I had put two buckets of water on the fire, I had scattered it out, and I was getting another bucket of water to put on it. 
And then I remembered that uh, the Chelsea Flower Show was on, and that's when I went back inside. As I was coming back from the tap, with the with third bucket of water from over there, and uh, I was coming, walking back like this with the bucket of water, and as I got to this position, I saw a man coming from the corner of my garden who had forced his way in. It was at this point that he pulled a hammer out from behind his back and hit me over the head with it. My husband had blood all over his face, and I thought he was dead. Coming up. A woman suspects she's being followed by the man next door. Every time I came out, they'd be out as well. And two neighbours in Southampton come to blows over dog fouling. His eyes start to shine with rage, and he snarled, why you? Trian and Carla Ellis and their four-year-old son, Lorenzo, live on a street like any other, on the outskirts of Banbury in Oxfordshire. We're just an ordinary family. We don't do anything massively interesting. We like our privacy. We're not socially inept. We're quite <laughs> happily... We're polite people. They had been there for three years when, in 2005, the Page family moved in next door. And at first, they got on fine. The only thing I would say is that they appeared a little bit maybe over-friendly. But after four years, things changed. At the beginning of 2009, when there was the recession, uh, Mrs Page had told us that Mr Page's business had been hit quite hard. In April, we went to Australia to get married. It probably seemed out of their window. We were doing really well. According to the Ellises, the divide deepened as the Pages found their unkempt garden an eyesore because I don't think he had much work. He put his focus into doing their garden, and I just got the impression that we had to follow suit. It was around that time that he stopped speaking to us. Every time they saw the Ellises, the pages would stand and stare, but say nothing. The couple felt intimidated, but then other bizarre stuff started happening. What we've got here is some examples of junk mail that we were getting. This one's addressed to Mr Alfred Wagner, which, never heard of that. Most of it seemed to be based around gardening magazines. If you look at the names Mr A Wagner and Mr A Kent, if you change a couple of the letters so Mr A Wagner could read Mr A something rather offensive. It's all very psychological and just almost a bit creepy. As if somebody is playing psychological games. games. We'd had snide comments from Mr and Mrs Page about weeds in our garden. You know, you sort of piece two and two together and we think it's, it's them sending it to us. Trian was convinced this was a personal attack, but without any proof, they had no choice but to get on with their lives. We'd been trying for a baby, and then in June 2010, um, we found out I was pregnant, which was very good news. But then something unnerving happened. And we didn't plan to tell anybody until I'd had the 12-week scan. Around week 10 or 11, I went out on a school reunion. One of the girls that was there was a friend of Mrs Page's, and she congratulated me on my news. She told me that Mrs Page had told her, to which I was dumbfounded, I think. Yeah. We did have a bit of paranoia, if you like, of how has she got that information, and it can only be from earwigging in a conversation that we've had inside our own home. However the Pages found out, they decided not to let their paranoia run away with them. But then the disturbing events became more visible. Unfortunately, I was very sick during my pregnancy. When I felt slightly better, I used to try and go out for a walk each day, just to the end of the road and back. Each time I went out, Mr and Mrs Page would come out shortly after me and follow me up the road. It happened too many times for it to be a coincidence. I came out at different times every day, and every time I came out, they'd be out as well.
I found it quite scary and intimidating. Being pregnant and often on her own, Carla was terrified by the neighbour's constant presence and alarming stares. So in August 2010, they took drastic measures. With the following, that was the final nail in the coffin. So we called the police and asked for their help. We wanted to get it sorted out before we had the baby. The police told the Ellises they had instructed the pages to stop following Carla. But rather than putting an end to their nightmare, it was only just the beginning. In Wales, James and Angela Killian had been living in relative peace with the caravan park next door. When in 2012, an irate resident stormed into their garden. It was 72-year-old, 18 stone, James Sharrod. It was at this point that he pulled a hammer out from behind his back and hit me over the head with it, just at this position. Uh, I naturally put my hand up, uh, just pure instinct and self-preservation, I guess. But he made contact with my head and then continued to hit me in a motion like this on top of my head. And I went right down on the ground here immediately. And he was on top of me. I was in such a state of, of concussion, panic and terror. So I then started shouting and screaming. As soon as I looked over, I could see that there was a man on top of my husband. And my husband had blood all over his face and I thought he was dead. And then luckily my wife came out, running and shouting from the back of the house, and managed to push him off me. He had the hammer in his hand, and I said, you've been hitting him with that hammer. And he came up to me with his chest out, and he put it behind his back and said, what hammer? So I then had, had, a, had a fork over here, a pitchfork, so I went and picked that up, and I held it like this. And that's when I said, no, don't. I said, you'd be as bad as them. Then, all of a sudden then, I heard some shouting coming from the road, and a cyclist had been passing by. There was blood everywhere. Blood was all over the place. As the cyclist said, I look like something out of a horror picture. That's when they turned tail and, and just went through the gap. The horrified cyclist called the police. Police came and tried to find the hammer. They couldn't find the hammer, yet he's 20 yards, 30 yards from the boundary. Uh, this, is, this is a picture of uh, my head afterwards, just immediately after leaving hospital. Uh, you can see I had eight stitches across here. There were lumps underneath the hairline, where he also had hit me but hadn't cracked the skin open throughout the hairline. At the time, I thought I was having my last breath. I thought the game was up. Well, we didn't sleep at all. We were just in total shock. Um, we just couldn't believe that something like that could happen. If I hadn't been here, then he'd have been dead. The attacker was Park resident James Sherrod, who was arrested at the scene and charged with wounding, inflicting grievous bodily harm. The attack may have only lasted seconds, but its effects would change their lives forever. These are the medicines that I have to take now. The picture itself doesn't really belie the, the damages that it has caused to me directly between the symptoms of brain atrophy, chronic back pain, uh, where I have trapped vertebrae and so on, uh, trapped nerves leading to sciatica, and some days I can't walk at all. My wife is a mental wreck, really. She won't go anywhere at all now without me with her. It has made me a prisoner in my own home, yes. Yes, definitely. After the attack, our children were too scared to go out in the garden. I was too scared to let them out in the garden, even. She's been traumatised mentally in relation to this, and the fear and anguish she has is inexplicable, really. In court, Sharrod pleaded not guilty, but he was convicted of wounding and sentenced to 12 months in prison. As the judge said, if he was a few years younger, uh, he'd be getting 10 to 15 years. Does it mean then if you pass 50 or 60, you can do what you want with a two pound lump hammer? Despite James's attacker being in prison, things were about to take a disturbing twist when the caravan park owner tried to claim some of their garden. No trees have gone. In Southampton, 54 year old Laurel Wingfield lives in a ground floor flat overlooking a communal garden. She's been here since 2006, and suffering from ME, the easy access meets her every need. Before I became ill, I, be I was very active. Uh, I was an archaeologist. 
Um, I did martial arts. I cycled everywhere. Life now is very difficult. Everything's a struggle. As her illness worsened, the communal gardens became an important focus. This is a garden that I created with the help of a friend. I could look out and see the roses and the bedding plants. And it was just nice to make something pleasant here. And it just looked as if a lot of hard work had gone into it. Unfortunately for Laurel, not all the residents appreciated the new planting. Well, a friend who would help me to put this together, uh, she would be working on the garden and she'd start to notice that there was dog feces all over it. I thought, how selfish, just how selfish of someone to do that. It wasn't long before Laurel thought she'd spotted the culprit. Rocco, the Highland Terrier. His owner was Harry Mitchell, a retired policeman. The first time I met Harry was when I was seeing a friend off late at night. And then out of the corner of my eye, um, I saw Harry come from behind the block with his dog. And I knew that somebody had been taking the dog around there to mess on the garden. And I asked him, have you just taken your dog around there to mess on the garden? And the response was the most unbelievable flood of abuse. Just shouting, just a constant torrent of noise. He accused me of going into the garden myself and messing in the garden myself. <laughs> Outraged at her neighbour, but terrified to confront him again, she reported him and his dog to the council. They responded by sending a warning letter to all residents, including Harry, stating that dogs are not permitted to foul common areas. On the day that the letter arrived, I was in the kitchen and I saw Harry come from his flat across the communal area, uh, marching across. He looked furious and he started yelling at me. I know it was you. I know it was you. I tried to reason with Harry. I tried to point out, look, it says in the tenancy agreement, people who have dogs have to keep control of them. And, and then I saw his face go red. And, and his eyes started to shine with rage. And he snarled, why you? And I, I realised he's going to attack me. And I, I had to slam the door in his face. But I, I've lived in fear of that man ever since. Harry denies all knowledge of this event. Terrified of tackling Harry directly, Laurel reported every dog poo she spotted to the council. But with Harry fiercely insisting it was not Rocco, the council put up a gate to stop dogs coming into the garden. But these new gates created an even bigger problem for Laurel. I need the gates to be left open because with my disability, I'm dependent on a mobility scooter. When the back gate was closed, I had to get off my mobility scooter to open the gate. Um, as well as having chronic fatigue, I have balance problems. There's a very real risk of me uh, falling. Laurel hoped that leaving the gate open would resolve her problem. There was one occasion when I needed to go somewhere and I, I thought it would be easier if I went out and opened it and then I could go through it on my scooter later. Harry went out, came out from behind the fence on the other side of the path closed the gate and stood there holding it closed. I don't know his reasoning, why it's so important to him that they be kept closed. Uh, I can only guess that it's so that his dog can't run out on the road. The gate now became a new problem for the whole community and Laurel insisted that it stopped her getting to her house. Harry actually came around and stood on my patio so that I couldn't park my scooter. And he was threatening me with sending me a solicitor's letter just because I left the gate open. Um, Harry was talking so loudly that night that half the block must have heard him. Laurel's upstairs neighbour, Samantha Owen, heard the row. I could hear an argument brewing. Harry was talking to her in a raised voice, 
and making threats to her. He was loud. I mean, if I could hear her through a closed door um, while watching TV, um, then, you know, you could hear it at the end of the block. His behaviour was aggressive. It was just a noise. He's just talking all the time. I, I couldn't reply because he just wouldn't stop talking. You don't accost people, disabled women, at night, in the dark, in their back garden. It was pure intimidation. Harry has denied all knowledge of this event. Coming up, the Ellis's relationship with next door turns to psychological warfare. Just tell me where he is, you effing bitch. Laura Wingfield resorts to surveillance. What? Oi. And the Killian's nightmare with their neighbours continues. We are living here in fear that he's going to come round and do it again. If your home life our competition could really make a difference. We've got £10,000 to give away. Imagine what you could do with 10 grand. Maybe you could take the family away for a well-deserved holiday. Or perhaps it's time to spruce up your home and reclaim the garden from the wilderness. Whatever it is you need, Channel 5 wants to give you a helping hand. So for your chance to win, call 0904 161 9955 or text WIN to 85545 or post your name and phone number to win PO Box 7557, Derby, DE1, 0NP. Calls cost £1.53 from a BT landline. Calls from other landlines and mobiles may cost considerably more. Text cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. Lines close at midday on the date shown on screen and three days later for postal entries. For rules, go to channel5.com forward slash win. In Oxfordshire, Trian and Carla Ellis believed their neighbours had launched a persistent campaign of psychological terror against them. The next thing we noticed was that Mr Page was starting to block up one of the windows on his house. In March 2012, when putting her son to bed, Carla noticed something ominous from his bedroom window. As I stood here, I could see the breeze blocks going further and further up, and on the centre one there was a picture of a person's eye with a pupil and eyelashes looking directly at me. We took that to be another cryptic message that they're still watching us. They'd had warnings from the police not to follow us and we just took it as their way of saying, we can't follow you but we can watch you, we're still watching you. It's just disgusting, horrifying, shocking I suppose. Suspecting the eye was there to spy, they became even more troubled by bizarre goings-on near their property. I arrived home to find some bricks on the, on the boundary on Mr and Mrs Page's drive, just here, in the shape of a, a T for, I'm presuming, Trian, and then an upside-down V, which was a bit strange. The only thing I can think of is it was a, a Mickey take out of my uh, teeth. For Trian, this was no joke. So far, the incidents had been psychological. But in June 2012, over three years since the trouble started, things got very physical. I was woken up with a jolt with hammering on the door. I was half asleep, wasn't sure what it was. I was here alone on my own with an 18-month-old baby. So then I decided that I wouldn't go down the stairs, I'd go through and I'd open the window. Looked out. Realised that it was actually Luke Page from next door um, kicking my front door in. I was the other side of the county when Carla phoned me in a panic. I sh asked him what he wanted and he just shouted at me, where's Trian with I'm going to effing kill him? And I said, he's not here. And he said, just tell me where he is, you effing bitch. So I made my way to the police station and then the police followed me back home to make sure it was all calm. Predatory behaviour just shows that they're watching, watching us come in, watching us go in, preying on us and it's a, it's a psychological game. 
your home is supposed to be your sanctuary, somewhere you want to go, somewhere where you chill out and relax and have fun. We dread coming home. Still panicked, the next morning, Carla found a note. And it said, to Carla, sorry I knocked on your door last night. I know I should not have done it. I'd had some beer and acted like a fool. Again, sorry, from Luke Page. So I was quite pleased that they'd sent an apology, but at the same time, it was a bit half-hearted. And I don't think you can ever apologise enough for scaring somebody like that in the middle of the night and trying to kick their front door in. Um, so, you know, a little bit of paper with the word sorry on it doesn't amount to anything, really. The police told the Ellises that Luke Page had received a verbal harassment order. But despite this, their nightmare was far from over. I'd come to the park with Lorenzo on a nice, cold October afternoon. We were the only ones in the park. I look up and I've got Mr and Mrs Page stood there facing me, just staring. And by the time I'd stood up and went to grab my phone, they were then started to walk away. Trian managed to capture something on his mobile phone, and he was convinced the shadowy figures in the distance were the pages. He showed it to the police and believes the pages were told to stop following them once again. It was horrible. And as if things weren't spooky enough, a Halloween prank would bring more unease for Trian. It was on 1st of November, day after Halloween. Came out onto the drive at 5 o'clock, and my truck was parked here. And what I found was eggs sprayed across at this angle, all across the bed, all at the back of the cab. There must have been phew, 10 eggs. You could see the markings on the shells. I gathered as much of the eggs up as I could. I went to the police station. I wanted to know if there was any evidence that we could obtain from them. The police said that they wouldn't be able to obtain any forensic evidence off of an eggshell. Trian thought things couldn't get any worse, but he was soon to be proved very wrong. In Wales, James Killian had been viciously attacked by a resident of the caravan park next door. Since the attack, I have serious depression. I see the futility of life. Uh, I'm basically a shell of my former self. His attacker, James Sharrod, had been released on a tag, but was not allowed to return home to the caravan park. For now, James and Angela could breathe a sigh of relief and decided to take a short break. The morning after we arrived back from our lovely holiday, I got out of bed and I went to the window and that's when I saw that our trees had gone. And I turned to my husband, I said, our trees have gone. And he said, well, what do you mean our trees have gone? I said, they've gone. I said, somebody's taken them away. I just couldn't believe it. I was in, in shock and agog. This is what the garden was like. All these trees were in situ here. Approximately eight trees in the background. Now you can see that there's nothing there. So he cleared the place out like for a building site, which was his intention to take the land over. Because I'd already communicated with Cunningham saying I was taking the trees down, it was my land, and I was going to build a wall there because the bloke in the second shack attacked me with a two pound lump hammer, you know, 12 months earlier. There it is all starting again. The trees were on the Killian's land and provided the only barrier between them and the caravan park. So when Mr. Cunningham appeared at the end of their garden, Angela was afraid. I grabbed the video camera and I went out to see what was going on. I see you've knocked our trees down. No, we are doing that. Okay. We're going to be doing our, fe our wall. I was We're absolutely so nervous. And I'm shaking like a leaf. Yeah, but are you going to put it in the right place? Well. Because you've obviously been on our property and taken our trees. We have got in writing where the boundary is, but who planted the trees? Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> We've got that. Well, can you, can you not do anything until we get a surveyor here to 
to mark the boundary correctly. Okay, that's all right. There's nothing we're going to fall out about. Um. Well, <laughs> look, we have been ill. I'm still recovering, okay? I know you had trouble, and I know you had trouble with that chap in there. That yeah, that bastard there, yes. James was convinced Cunningham was trying to steal five feet of their garden and put the fence up before he noticed. So he called in a surveyor. This is where the trees were, along this edge, like that. You can see my boundary is further, further out. We wouldn't have needed to take the trees away at all in the first place because there's sufficient distance here. And what he wants to do is try and claim the land from there into approximately here for the simple reason that the owner of this, of this caravan site wants to return another mobile home. So therefore, he tried to encroach on this land. But he's well known for this kind of behavior because he's done it before. Although James had reclaimed his land, with the trees gone, they were now exposed. And they were about to get very disturbing news about the man who had attacked him. In July of this year, we were informed that Sherrod was back at his home, which is essentially 30 yards from our boundary. He's there living in the, enjoying the freedom of Gower, enjoy the freedom of, of this nice, beautiful area, but we can't. We're terrified. We're living here in fear that he's going to come around and do it again. In Southampton, Laura Wingfield had come to blows with her neighbour, Harry Mitchell, when she suspected his dog of defecating in the shared garden. Harry is always picking up anything that's laying around anyway. I stand outside and have a cigarette dead on 10 o'clock, and he's always out there picking up any rubbish and whatever the dog's left, I suppose. And he's, I mean, he's very good to you, isn't he? He's very good to me, yes. With the neighbourhood divided, Laurel and Samantha started legal action against the council to have the gates removed. They lost. And if she's not happy in that situation, she needs to ask the council for a move. Yeah. Where there is no, there is no gate. Quite frankly, if, if a gate's put on there, it's put on there for a reason, isn't it? Yeah. Of course it is. But not long after, the gate totally disappeared. One particular day, and I saw her unscrewing hinges, but I didn't realise at the time that's what she was actually doing. It wasn't until later on in the day that I noticed the gate was off and within our courtyard. So she's obviously been taking the gate off. Did, did she... Did somebody saw me do it? <sighs> well, how could they? I didn't do it. With the gate no longer a problem for Laurel, she turned her attention back to her neighbour's dog. The council asked me, do I have any proof that the dog was running loose? So I started filming the dog. It's about uh, 25 past 9 a.m. And yes, there's Harry's dog again. I was sitting here filming Harry's dog running loose. Now over 12 minutes. He should shut that dog out. Now it doesn't know what to do. As I was filming, Harry came out, he saw me, and he started shouting at me. Do you mind, madam? Do I mind what? Do you mind? Oi! You, you were assaulting me, Harry. Oh, I'm not assaulting you. you. You were assaulting me by taking pictures. His arm shot out. He grabbed me by the wrist with one hand, and he tried to take my, my, my camcorder with the other hand. You are assaulting me, and I'm going to have you arrested. You, I, 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 I am getting evidence that you are breaking your tenancy agreement but, by letting your dog run loose, unsupervised, and uncontrolled he, in I, a communal area. I, I didn't know he. I didn't know he was in. Oh, you didn't know he was out. No, I've been indoors with my wife. She's in the shower. You open the door, put him outside, shut no, the I door. No, I did not. No, I did not. He might have come out well, doing some washing, but I didn't see him come out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Laura. I did not see him come out of this door. You just assaulted me and I'm going to report you. I did not assault you. I pushed, yes, I you did. You grabbed me. I pushed the camera in the way. Don't lie. I was in shock. I, I, I thought he was going to hit me. The police were called and Laurel claims they agreed to talk with Harry under caution. No other action was taken. Despite this, Harry holds no grudge. I'm quite happy about the police. If Laurel came to me for help, or anybody in here, I'll do the same as I normally do, help them. Harry denies all allegations made by Laurel on behalf of himself and Rocco. 
Laurel is continuing to complain to the council about the poo in the garden and is determined to get evidence. Oh, and I finally caught him messing on the grass. <sighs> yep, finally got proof. Still to come, Trian and Carla fear for their lives. We started having conversations about bullet vests. Is this really happening? And the Killians face their worst fears. The truth always comes out. Never forget that, scumbag. Don't forget about your chance to boost your bank account by a massive £10,000. You could take a family holiday or spruce up your home. It's completely up to you. To enter, call 0904 161 9955 or text WIN to 85545 or post your name and phone number to WIN, PO Box 7557, Derby DE10 NP. For rules, go to channel5.com forward slash WIN. In Oxfordshire, the Ellis family had been victims of a series of psychological attacks that have left them afraid to leave their home. Tree and Ellis has convinced their next door neighbours the pages are behind it and has desperately been gathering evidence to prove it to the police. OK, so this is a bag of evidence that I've gathered over the years. It's a court that's been thrown at our bedroom window. We have a leaflet to do with gardening yet again, the white pebble, with the green paint, which is off the back of our Picasso when it was stoned. An array of cigarette ends, various different stones, all the stones match. I mean, I'm not a stone expert, but... And then we've got the uh, squeaky toy that was thrown into our garden. And that's an old toy that's been thrown in at some point. But one night, they were disturbed by something far more dangerous when they heard an alarming noise outside. I went to the office and had a quick look to see if I could see it. There was nothing on our drive, nobody on our drive. So we just brushed it off, didn't we? The next morning, Trian turned detective again. As soon as I closed the gate, I clocked it straight away. Big bit of the paint missing on the car. And when I detailed, I could see it had been pellet gunned. And then it just, I froze. And it's like, is this really happening? And then it all fell together. The noise on the glass we heard last night must have been coming off of the car and then your mind's going crazy. Am I next? The police, however, could find no evidence, leaving the Ellises terrified for their safety. After the car had been shot, we started having conversations about bullet vests and us wearing bullet vests. Who has conversations about wearing <laughs> bullet vests in all seriousness? just to walk around your own property. But that is the crazy level that this was now at. Trian and Carla presented their latest batch of evidence to the police. The police looked at all the evidence and called Mr and Mrs Page in to be questioned under caution, to which they both got a written harassment warning. But the Ellises were also in for a nasty surprise. I'd just got home from work, and then I had a police officer banging on the door and slapped two pieces of paper on my ironing board and said, there's a written harassment warning for you and one for Trian. And the harassment warning stated that an allegation of me calling Mr and Mrs Page paedophiles. Allegations which the Ellises fiercely deny. By now, the Ellises were desperate to expose the pages. Everything they do is so covert that all of the other neighbours round here have absolutely we no idea. This, we want this out in the open because we've been living with this silently for too long, haven't we? They are trying to control us 
by instilling that fear into us and the intimidation and the games and the psychological abuse. Although they still have no proof, Trian and Carla are convinced they are the subject of a campaign against them. When we asked the pages for their version of events, they didn't respond. I think I would have probably moved some time ago, if I'm being honest. I completely disagree. I don't see why we should be forced to move out of a house that we like in an area that we like just because somebody next door wants to set up a campaign against you. In Wales, the Killians were still reeling from the caravan park owner trying to take 12 foot of land. And with their trees gone, there was no peace from some of the residents of the caravan park next door. Stop it. You did nothing at all. You said to my wife, uh, my wife said you're being killed. You said, so what? The truth always comes out. Never forget that, scumbag. Most worrying, the neighbor who attacked James with a hammer reappeared on the caravan site after being convicted and serving time for wounding. This is where I was standing. Um, and I was looking at my garden and seeing the weeds when I noticed uh, Mr. Sharrod and his wife and another lady out in the garden. And my first reaction was to go back in. And then I thought, no, I stand my ground and face my fears, as I say. With that, I, I heard faintly that, um, oh, we're being watched. And they were all laughing. And then with that, Mr. Sharrod did a little jig and a bow like this. Clearly, Mr. Sharrod feels no remorse whatsoever in any shape or form. And th these actions in the past couple of days proved that. I felt intimidated. We contacted Mr. Sharrod and Mr. Cunningham for their version of events, and neither of them chose to respond. While the family are waiting for their new fence to go up, James has begun protecting them in other ways. Because of this attack and because of the trauma involved in the attack, we needed some added security, so we installed some CCTV cameras, 10 in all. And uh, the system looks like we've got here. It's recording 24-7, day and night. Even with the CCTV, Angela is looking forward to finally being cut off from their neighbours. Well, I find it quite un unnerving, actually. It's the first time, basically, I've been out here. Um, and uh, see all the memories, you know, flashing back. Just want everything to finish now. Um, you know, we want to put our fence up there, uh, enclose our garden again, and uh, just get on with our lives and just forget those people down there. In the meantime, Mr. Killian's PhD is on hold. And the whole family's life has been turned upside down. My youngest son said, he said, we don't laugh anymore. And that's basically how it's been. The transformation has been tremendous to my family, wife, and their well-being. Why should my kids have to suffer uh, because of this violent, ignorant criminal? Even now, I, I still see my husband with that man on top of him, thinking that he was dead. Um, you know, that, that, that horror, I don't suppose, will ever, ever go. Next time, former friends become sworn enemies. So I looked out, and then they the both stood there, saying, in bed, I just want to kill you all. Neighbours fight over flashing headlights. I just don't understand why I wouldn't be harassing her. And it's all out war in the Cotswolds. And he just went like that, and I just went. Tomorrow at 8, some more neighbours that might test your nerves. Meet those who live at Benefit House, me and my 22 kids. Next tonight, something close to a riot as dealing with debt gets nasty. The new series of Can't Pay Will Take It Away continues after the latest five news headlines next.